Today's message is, is going to be a light-hearted message. Um, it's hopefully meant to encourage you, but it's not going to feel that way in the beginning. Um, it's going to feel heavy, and there's going to be a little tension in the room, and, and I'm okay with that. And the title of today's message is Wounded. Everybody say Wounded. And, and I'm willing to bet in here today that all of us, and when I say all of us, I mean most all of us, um, have some sort of wound within us that was given to us by um, a parent or a godly example or an ungodly example in our life. So all of us carry that wound with us, and many of us are trying to dig out of the ditch that we were put in as a kid. One summer evening during a violent thunderstorm, a mother was tucking her, her little boy into bed. Uh, she was about to turn off the light when the little boy asked his mom in a trembling voice, Mommy, 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 would you sleep with me tonight? She smiled and, and gave him a reassuring hug, but said, I, I, I can't, dear. I have to sleep with your daddy tonight. After a long silence, the little boy replied, The big sissy. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about what some people, or really the last decades, have begun to define as the father wound. Now, the father wound was a concept that originated with Robert Bly and was popularized by John Eldridge in his book called Wild at Heart. I want to read a few sentences or a portion of John's description of this father wound. He said, Every boy in his journey to become a man takes an arrow to the center of his heart, which is the place of his greatest strength. And because that wound is rarely discussed, it is rarely healed, so he carries that wound with him into adulthood, and that wound is almost always caused by his father. American greeting cards set up a tent in a prison on Mother's Day for inmates to be able to write a card and to honor their mothers on Mother's Day. Surprisingly, the lines were so long that they had to send a, a group of people to make another trip back to the factory so they could get more cards for these inmates to sign. Now, due to the success of that event, they thought we will do this again on Father's Day. Sadly, this time, not one inmate showed up. The Family Research Council in Washington, D.C. found that 70% of those in prison did not have a father growing up. The research team analyzed 11,000 crimes and found no correlation between crime and poverty or crime and race. The only correlation between these crimes is that most of them were committed by individuals where no father was present in the home growing up. The study showed children with an absentee or abusive father are five times more likely to commit suicide, 32 times more likely to run away from home, 20 times more likely to have behavioral disorders, 14 times more likely to commit rape, nine times more likely to drop out of school, 20 times more likely to end up in prison, and six times more likely to need treatment for alcohol and drug abuse. Now, to be really, really clear, the reality is our relationship with our mothers can be a little complicated too. Can we acknowledge that? For some of you in here today, it wasn't your relationship with your mom that's caused all this emotional term, or your dad. It was your relationship with your mom that caused a little. Get, get, I don't want to ask you to raise your hand because your mom might be with you here today, and that'd be really awkward. <laughs> but can we at least acknowledge that that may be true in many cases? In fact, to be even more honest than that, let's just be real, really real in here today. Sometimes the wound that's been caused to us is by our very own children. How about hollering at your boy for that one? There are an unlimited amount of opportunities for us to wound those that we love and to hurt each other. Now, I know that there's someone here today, and you grew up in a really good home. I mean, you went to church together every Sunday. Um, you had your family dinners. You took your family vacations, though I do not qualify anything as a family vacation. I call them family trips because anytime you add the kids to the equation, it's not a vacation. It's a trip because they be tripping. <laughs> Well, you did. You, your home is like the Partridge family and the Brady Bunch, and that's awesome. And maybe you even had prayer time together in your home around the dinner table. We don't have prayer time together in my home because when Miss Amy prays, God listens to her, and I don't want to know what she's praying about because it scares me to death. <laughs> but you did. You had Bible studies, and, and yet still, 
you have found yourself sometimes or found yourself sometimes feeling overlooked or insignificant compared to your siblings or maybe even misunderstood by your parents. There's many others of us in here today that, that grew up in this home that maybe was not so good. You may have had one or, or more parent that was emotionally or, or, or physically abusive or, or absent from you or even verbally. And when you look back, you, you don't have many good memories about your childhood and you still have that wound and you carry with you a lot of pain in your heart. Unfortunately, I, I believe there are probably a whole lot more wounded people in here today than there are people without those wounds. But sadly, th this is nothing new. The truth is, we don't have a lot of great examples of parenting, especially fatherhood in the scriptures. In fact, I'm going to show you two different stories from the Bible today. And one of them is a tragic, very sad ending. And the other one is more heartwarming and more encouraging. The first one is about the Old Testament man named David. Now, David was a mighty warrior. The Bible says he was brave in battle. David was a man after God's own heart. That's a pretty good description of a human being. David was a man who was mean on the strings. I mean, he could play that harp it's so beautifully. That's what brought him in before King Saul. And he was a man who was mean on the sling, too, because that's what made him kill Goliath and cut off Goliath's hand. Be like, ah, that's a pretty cool dude. I mean, I, I like that about David. I, I, I really like David. He, he wrote poetry, and he toppled kingdoms. I mean, one time, now this is, this is pretty cool. You've got to admit this. One time, David came home from war, and the women were lined up in the streets singing a song about him. Saul has killed his thousands, and David has killed his tens of thousands. Now, okay, men, you need to acknowledge with me, having a song written about you, and the ladies lining in the street to sing that to you is pretty cool, especially if you're a young man. I got to be honest with you. This has never happened to me before. But I'm hanging on to hope that one day I will come home after the mighty battle of preaching God's word. And Miss Amy's going to be standing in the driveway just singing to me. I can feel it. It might be today. I may be prophesying it today that I'm going to come home. And she'll be like, what a man, what a man, what a mighty good man. And I'm going to be like, well, you can tell everybody. Go ahead and tell everybody. I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm the man. You know what I'm saying? The very next line of that says, I believe every lie that I'm told, that's probably true. <laughs> David was a mighty good man. David fought many battles. In fact, he had so much blood on his hands that God would not allow him to build his temple or his house because he had so much blood on his hands. He may have been a mighty good man, but he was a not so good father. And he finds himself in a battle that he didn't want to fight. This was not a battle against another nation, uh, another kingdom, or another country. David could take care of those. This battle was in his own home with his own son. It's a complicated story that takes place over several chapters, so I don't have time to read all of that to you. So let me just summarize it and keep it as simple as I can. King David had a son named Absalom. And Absalom was sassy. Sexy. I didn't want to say that because of the kids in the room, but nobody's paying attention to what I'm saying. Absalom was sexy. You don't believe me. Let me read to you. Now, Absalom was praised as the most handsome man in all Israel. Listen, if the word of God says you are the most handsome dude in the entire country, you're pretty sexy. In fact, he was flawless from head to foot. This is the Bible's description of him. He only cut his hair once a year, and then, because it was so heavy, and when he weighed it out, it came to five pounds. Now, I've never known what five pounds of hair is like. I don't know, but I have been told that's a lot of hair. He's a pretty handsome dude. Well, Absalom had a half-brother named Amnon and a sister named Tamar. Tamar. David, now this is the longer story, had multiple wives and many illegitimate kids. Tragically, Absalom's half-brother raped his full sister, his biological sister. When David found out about this, he was furious. It was in his own home. But sadly, he didn't do anything about it. Well, as you can imagine, Absalom is furious too. He's mad. His half brother raped his sister. And that wound that was created in that moment never healed. Well, a couple years go by, and Amnon, the guilty brother, was invited to a party. He got drunk at that party, and Absalom had his, his men murder him because of what he did. You thought your family functions were dysfunctional? You ought to read the Bible. Get a cray-cray up in there. 
In fact, let's read it. Two years later, when Absalom's sheep were being sheared at Baal, Baal Hazard under Ephraim, or Ephraim, Absalom invited all the king's sons to come to a feast. He went to the king and said, My sheep shears are now at work. Will the king and his servants please come to celebrate the occasion with me? The king replied, No, my son. If we all came, it would be too much of a burden on you. Now, the reality is David knows something's up. I mean, you don't naturally invite all of your brother, brothers to a party, so he's not quite uh, confident in what the, the motivations are. But Absalom presses him, but the king would not come, though he gave Absalom his blessing. Well, then, Absalom said, if you can't come, how about sending my brother Amnon with it? So this should have been a, a red herring. Like, wait a minute. Why are you asking specifically for the brother that you hate that raped your sister? So the king says, why well, Amnon? But Absalom kept on pressing the king until he finally agreed to let all of his sons attend, including Amnon. So Absalom prepared a feast fit for a king, and Absalom told his men, wait until Amnon gets drunk, then at my signal, kill him. Don't be afraid. I'm the one who's given the command, take courage and do it. So at Absalom's signal, they murdered Amnon. Meanwhile, we're skipping a few verses here. Meanwhile, Absalom escaped. Verse 38, after Absalom fled and went to Geshur, he stayed there three years. So three years after fleeing, and it's a long story, Joab, the commander of uh, David's army, goes to, to, to uh, David and says, listen, you're going to have to um, allow this man back into the city. It's split the kingdom. It's not a great example. You need to make sure that you restore this relationship. So King David allows him to come back into the city where he lives. Now, I would love to tell you that that Absalom apologized and, and David apologized and they're like, hey, we wish we had done more. Uh, we didn't do enough to restore this relationship. They forgave each other. The wound was healed and generations were different because with the power of God and the healing forgiveness of God, it restored the relationship. But tragically, that's not what happened. Instead, what happened is this. But the king gave this order. Absalom may go to his own house and he must never come into my presence. So Absalom did not see the king. This is a heartbreaking and a very tragic story. And perhaps it is very similar to many of yours. You are in the same town with your family, but you have no relationship with your family. Why? Because trust has been broken, and it may never be restored. And when you do spend time with your family during the, the holidays, the home is messy, and it's just, it's just complicated. There's this awkward silence and this thick tension, and everybody is just on the edge, and there's too much pain, and there's too much brokenness for there to be any sense of joy and peace in the home during the holidays. Now, hopefully there wasn't rape or murder in your family, but, but perhaps you grew up in a home where you really wanted to be proud of your dad. And you really, really wanted to have that moment to say, that's my dad. But as much as you would be proud of your dad, your dad continued to do things that just kept embarrassing you. Or maybe you wanted your dad to be proud of you. But no matter what you did, your dad would never say he's proud of you. You always could have done better. There was always somebody further along the ladder than you. You always could have done more. Or maybe it wasn't your dad. It may have been your mom. And maybe you wanted more than anything to have your mother's approval. But everything you did, your mom just criticized you, and she just criticized you, and she just kept criticizing you. Maybe you're here today, and your parents divorced. Your dad went one way, your mom went another way, and now your kids are suffering because of their decision. Or maybe you felt like you didn't always matter. You felt like you were invisible to your parents. They didn't come to your games, or if they did come to your games, they were always on the phone, or they were always, you know, at the recital, standing out in, in the lobby, and, and they were just kind of, they were there, but they weren't really there, and you felt all alone. Almost all of us have a wound that won't go away. And what's so heartbreaking is David actually loved his son. And yet because of how deep that wound was, they never made up. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And if you don't know the end of this story, it's like the Titanic. I mean, everybody can see that ship is just going down and down. And it just keeps sinking until, tragically, thousands of lives are lost. And that's what happened to Absalom. He got so bitter. And he got so bitter. And he got so angry, he decides he's going to overthrow the kingdom. And essentially, he declares war against his own father. 
And David, this man who had, you know, really captured the kingdom and had songs written about him, the man who had saved the kingdom, is now run out of his own country. And Absalom takes David's ten concubines and sleeps with them on his, David, on his father's house so the whole kingdom would see the turmoil of this nation. And as he's preparing to go into battle with his own son, David decreed over the army, hey, listen, if you run into my son, take it easy on my son. But you can imagine the men were mad. Like, we've lost everything, and you're telling us to take it easy on your son? So they didn't follow orders. Now, this, is, this is where it gets kind of funny. Absalom was riding through a thick forest on his donkey, his, his, his colt there, his, his stallion. And because the, the, thor, the forest was so thick and his hair was so thick, his hair got caught in a thick forest in the trees, which is why I choose to shave my head. I think, according to the Bible, thick hair is dangerous and it will get you killed. So I just decide I'm not going to mess with it. As he's hanging in this tree, Joab, the commander of David's army, takes three spears and shoves them through the heart of Absalom. Word gets back to David, and here's how David responds. The king was overcome with emotion. He went up to the room over the gateway and burst into tears. As he went, he cried, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. It's too little, too late. A wound that never completely healed tore apart the family forever. And thousands of years later, we're reading about it. We're still dealing with it over there today. It just never went away. And sometimes the, the greatest battles that are fought are not those that we can see on the outside. It's the battle of the healing from the wound that was given to us by our parents that is being fought on the inside. Now, that's the first story. We could just say, everybody have a great Father's Day. I'll see you later. <laughs> and we'd be very depressed. Are you ready for a better story? The second story is also between a father and a son. But this father acts as a shield, as a hiding place, a shelter, and a father who is always willing to fight for his son. And though we do not have many great examples of fatherhood in Scripture, we do have one. And he sets the example how we as fathers are to love our children. And he shows up at a very public event for his son, his son's baptism. And the father shows up at his son's baptism, and he publicly states this about his son. And those of you who grew up in a painful home, you wanted so desperately to hear this from your parents. And if you're a parent, your children want so desperately to hear these things from you. And it's found in Matthew 3. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. This is my son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. In this moment, God the Father shows up on the scene, and he's publicly declaring, this is my son. I am pleased with him. No matter what he does or does not do, because of who he is, I am proud of him, and I believe in him, and I will always, always, always love him. Jesus, as you start this ministry, before you've done any miracles, I need you to know that I am with you, that I am cheering you on, that I am in your corner, that you have what it takes and I believe in you and not only do I want you to hear it I want you to see it so the heavens opened up and the spirit of God descended like a dove and he gave his son something that every person whether you're male or female that you need today affection and affirmation because love has to be told and it has to be shown to be known children don't know about your love because you have love in your heart they know about your love when it is spoken over them and it is witnessed or seen in front of them now this is crazy important because moms and dads well they're equal in worth but they're different in roles and both mom and dad have irreplaceable roles in the life of their children we can acknowledge both are incredibly important but we do have to acknowledge their roles are a little bit different for example the mom's role, and I understand this is generally speaking, but in most households, the mom's role is nurturing. For example, if your kid gets a boo-boo, 
chances are pretty good that if they have a choice between mom and dad, they're going to run to the mom. Is that true in your house, Paul and Vicky? Because the mom's going to say, come here, baby, boo-boo. Let me see you, boo-boo. Let me kiss that boo-boo, and everything's going to be better. Can we acknowledge that? Dads probably don't say that. Dust it off. Or in fact, rub some dirt on it. In fact, stop crying, or I'll give you something to cry about. You didn't die. Oh, your toe hurts. Let me smack you in the jaw. Now your face is going to hurt. You forgot about your toe. That's the home I grew up in. In fact, to be honest with you, my mom and my dad, we're both this way. <laughs> One time I got 27 stitches in my leg, and I had to play a baseball game. I got to play a baseball game. I got 13 in my mouth, got my teeth knocked out, and they put a face mask on me and a leg brace on me. I won every mess of match because I looked like a freak out there on the mat. Nobody wanted to mess with me. I got stitched up on a guy's kitchen table two times. What I'm saying is both responses are important, so I've been told. <laughs> but one of those responses feels a little bit better than the other one. My point is, children need affection and affirmation. We need a word spoken. It's going to be okay. You're going to get through this. You're strong enough for this. You got this because God gave you gifts. You are more than a conqueror. You're a unique masterpiece. You're an overcomer. Love has to be spoken, and it has to be shown to be known. Now, did Jesus know that his father loved him? Of course he did. But there's still something about receiving a public spoken word of affirmation that is so powerful. Especially from a trusted male. There's something different about hearing a word spoken over us from a man that empowers us as children. And let me just say this today because I know there's single mothers in the room. It doesn't just have to be from a father. Some of the greatest examples in my house or in my life were youth pastors. They were coaches. They, they, they were male teachers. So there can be somebody to speak in as that male influence in their life. And this is why I believe one of the reasons church is so important and that men are needed in our kids and our student ministry. And for all the, the men that serve in our, our kids' ministry or they serve in our next generation department, I just want to say thank you. Can we give it up for them? I don't care what capacity they're saying, but even a security guard, they're there. These kids see that. There's something about having a man speak life over us that says you have what it takes. You can win this fight. You will win this war, and it empowers us because we all, as children, have this voice inside of us that says you're not good enough. This voice inside of us that says you don't have what it takes. And when you have this outside voice that's combating the internal voice that says, I do believe in you, and I am proud of you, and no matter what you do or don't do, I will always, always love you, that, in, that, that, that external voice gives us this internal confidence that we can stand strong and that we can fight our fears. So to every man who serves in our kids and students, your role is important because you may be representing the only trusted male influence that these children will ever have, and they need it. And it's not just affirmation that matters so much. It's also affection. And for many of us, I know this is generally speaking, but for most men, we don't know how to express our emotions and show our affection because we didn't receive any of it or we rarely saw any of it growing up. It's like calling your dad and, and asking, hey, Dad, are you proud of me? Do you love me? And your dad's like, well, yeah, I'm proud of me. I love you. I told you on the day that you were born. If it changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> Is that not so true? We rarely hear it because we've rarely seen it. For instance, men don't naturally go around saying, hey, Paul, I just want you to know something today. I really, really love you. Paul, I know that we're naked in the shower today, but can I just give you a hug today? Because if a man did that to me, I'd be like, you come at me, bro, one more time, this ain't going to end well for one of us. You know what I'm saying? Men don't naturally go around doing that. Men, we mock each other, and we make fun of each other, and we give each other stupid nicknames. That's how we show affection. And every once in a while, if we're an athlete, we'll give each other a pat on the rear end, but it's a straight hand. If you cup, I will cut you. You cup your hand, I will cut you with a knife. Am I saying the truth? I'm, just, I'm speaking, I'm just speaking. God gave me that word today. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was the devil. I don't know, but I said it. Because listen to this. 
When my friends say to me, Daniel, how in the world did a bald-headed, bow-legged country bumpkin like you get a beautiful brown-headed lady like Miss Amy? I say, thank you. That was a great compliment. Thank you for complimenting me today. You know I outpunted my coverage. You're acknowledging there's something about me that got a woman like her. You know what I'm saying? I don't think anybody's ever walked up to Miss Amy and said, how did a brown-headed country bumpkin oaky like you get a stud like Rev? I don't think women do that to one another. They wouldn't be friends because women don't talk to each other that way. Women talk to each other like, hi, love. Oh, girl, you look so pretty today. Hey, babe. Oh, babe, I just love your dress. You've got killer curves today. Ain't no man going to say anything like that to me or I will shank them. <laughs> and in an office full of women, it's a little weird. It's a little annoying. Men don't go around doing that. But just because we don't know how to give it doesn't mean that we don't need it. And every child, male or female, needs affirmation and affection. We all need someone to look at us and say, I believe in you. I am pleased with you. And no matter what you do or don't do, I love you. And not only do we need to hear, we need to see it. Why? Because every young male or female is fighting this inner fear of failure. And that's one of the reasons why we as a church spend so much time celebrating and encouraging one another. And ladies, here's the thing. And you may not know this, but you like to be encouraged in a different way than most men like to be encouraged. For, for most women, you want to know, are you cherished? Are you valued uniquely as a woman? You, you do not want to be compared to another woman. You want to be cherished and valued for who you are. And today really matters. So men, you need to listen to your wife. You need to spend quality time with her. You need to do something that she enjoys. You need to help her around the house. Doing the dishes may be the sexiest thing that you can ever do for your wife. I don't understand it, but for some reason it works for them. And listen to me, men. You get points when you help her around the house. But watch this. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. In a woman's economy, all points evaporate overnight. At midnight, they like gone. And sometimes it's hour by hour. You're like, baby, I did the dishes this morning. Yeah, but you didn't do them in the afternoon. Forget you. I don't understand it, but it's absolutely true. Men, we live on compliments and are gifts that are years and sometimes decades old. Hey, Dad, are you proud of me? Yeah, I told you when you were 10. Get over it. And it's not that we don't need it. It's just that we don't get it. Our world is very different. In the world that a man typically lives in, we rarely get consistent affirmation and affection, especially from other men. And what we want to know as a man is, do you respect me? Do you admire me? Do you trust me? And do you believe in me? Am I man enough to take care of your wants and your needs? And ladies, this won't make any sense to you, but that's why when you go with your husband to the mall, and you see that, that dress in the, in the window and you want to buy that dress. You're like, I look good on that dress. And then you walk around and you look at the price tag on that and you say, oh, we can't afford it. What you just did was you cut your man's feet right out from underneath him. Because that man, if you let him, will go, I'm going to the bathroom. And what he's really doing is going to sell a kidney because he wants to buy you that dress that you want. Because that's what we want to know. Can we meet your needs? Can we make all of your, your dreams come true? Am I able to take care of you? Am I able to cherish you? And listen, you need to know this about us, ladies. As a man, our security evaporated with our last accomplishment. Everything in our world asks the question, what'd you sell today? What'd you score today? What'd you build today? What'd you produce today? What did you earn today? And culture programs us as men that we are only worth our last accomplishment. And that's why we too need to know do you respect me today? Do you admire me today? Do you believe in me? And am I able to meet your needs today? And ladies, I hope that you understand the men in your life will fight and they will stand strong until they feel they've lost your respect and they've been stripped of your belief in them. Or they're afraid they might let you down and they're not man enough to meet your needs. You see, when Miss Amy says to me, Daniel, I believe in you, and you're worth it, and you're a good man, 
It means to me more than anything because she knows me better than anyone. And if she doesn't believe in me and I don't feel worth it to her, I must not be worth it. Because every man fears failure. And one of the greatest fears that we have is not being able to provide for our families. It haunts us and keeps us awake at night to think that we can't meet our kids' needs, that we can't provide everything that they need, and that we are letting our family down. And what you do or don't do can be the difference in how we feel about ourselves. Now listen, I'm not saying that any of this is right. I'm just saying that's the way that it is. And that's why we need to give each other affirmation and affection. Because the greatest battles that we will ever fight are not the ones seen on the outside. They're the battles that are trying to be healed on the inside. And all of us have baggage. We've all been wounded. But here's the thing. We don't have to stay wounded. And if sadly you're in here today and you've never had a positive male influence in your life or somebody to speak positive words over your life, then I believe that God sent me here today in Father's Day 2022 to tell you that what God said about His Son Jesus, He also says about you. And if you've never had anybody in your life speak over you, I'll speak over you today. I want you to know you have what it takes. You are a winner. You are strong and mighty in the Lord under his power. By the stripes of Jesus, you can be healed of every wound that has held you back. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So continue to fight. In the end, you will be victorious. I believe in you. And I'm proud of every one of you. And no matter what happens, I will always, always, always love you. And don't let the enemy tell you anything different. Because God believed in you enough to send his son to die for you, to impart his spirit to fill you, to strengthen you to do everything he created you to do. In the end, you will be victorious. You may not win every battle. But a warrior is not a warrior because he wins every battle, because he never surrenders, he never retreats, and he never backs down, and he keeps getting back up. So keep, step up, and fight for what matters. Be strong enough to apologize when you get it wrong. Have the courage to own it. Have the strength to step in and step up and tell the people in your life, I love you, and I care about you, and I'm proud of you. And I believe in you, no matter what, I will always love you. Don't you dare hold back affection and affirmation. Don't you dare feel it and not express it. You release the blessings that are inside of you. Make sure that the internal things that you feel are expressed external. Because our children need it. And our community needs it. Our church needs it. And I need it. God gave us each other for a reason. Don't withhold anything good if you have the ability to give it. Father, we come before you today and we're so thankful that we have a heavenly Father that loved us enough to send his son to die on the cross to forgive us our sins. All of us were once enemies on the outside looking in, but by the blood of Jesus, you grafted us and you included us. We're not enemies, we're family, sons and daughters of the King. And there's anyone here that's never trusted, and may today be that day. But if we have the ability to say good or to do good, may we do it and never withhold from those who need it. Again, thank you for Jesus, and thank you for being the Father that we all need and we all want. It's in his mighty name that we ask these things today. Amen. And amen. Hey, fathers, I'm proud of you and I love you. Make sure you go to the concession stand and get you that pretzel and some nachos. See you next week.